node, I think it's, uh, it's time to start now. So, um, well, once again, welcome all of you to uh, the this Athens Science webinar, the British Corporate Renewable PPA Market. So um, today, our two experts, uh, Shailesh Telang from CDP and Lee Donovan from Norton Rose Fulbright, will give you um, uh, a better idea of what's happening in terms of uh, corporate renewable PPAs in the United Kingdom. So um, to start with, could you, uh, Lee, briefly introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, depending where you're joining from. My name is Lee Donovan. I'm an energy associate here in the London team, Norton Rose Fulbright, and uh, it's the Energy Infrastructure and Natural Resources team. So we specialize in the full um, service of um, energy advisory for clients, um, legal and commercial solutions. And in the past kind of five to 10 years, we've been very active in advising clients through corporate renewable PPAs, both in the UK and elsewhere. So hopefully uh, in a good place to uh, discuss this morning. Thank you, Lee. And uh, Shai Lesh, could you introduce yourself briefly as well, please? Thank you, Carlos. Um, Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Shailesh Telang. I work as technical manager with CDP. Uh, mainly, I work with the Renewable Energy team, which is a small team within CDP because most of you might be aware of CDP is known for environmental reporting platform, but we do have energy uh, component in the reporting uh, platform we operate. So primarily, we work on re 100 campaign and then we have other elements of renewable energy reporting which we try via our climate change disclosure platform so i welcome again thank you thank you shailesh so um right so now without further delay um please uh, shailesh share your presentation and start and uh, whilst uh, shailesh is getting his presentation up on the screen i just like to uh, remind you that this is your chance today to ask questions to our experts. So post your questions through the Q&A box, which you can see at the bottom of the uh, toolbar. And um, also, um, yeah, if you want to interact with other participants, you can post things on the chat box. But questions only in the Q&A box, please. Um, and um, we will send you the uh, presentations that will be delivered today and the recordings. So. Um, never fear, you'll get, you'll get them in your inbox in a couple of days' time. So, Shailesh, how are you getting on with the presentation? Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Can you please confirm it's visible? Yeah, it is visible. I can see it. Great, thank you. So, hello again, and uh, the, in this particular uh, portion of the presentation, I'm going to cover mostly uh, the reflection of uh, data reported by various companies, uh, primarily from uh, United Kingdom to CDP. And uh, we will cover like what data says, uh, what is the size of companies who are actively procuring renewable energy, uh, what are the size of companies who have uh, overarching renewable energy targets? Uh, how many of them are actively procuring renewable energy? And uh, then uh, I'll also take you through uh, with, uh, a small uh, version of technical criteria which uh, we follow under RE100 campaign, which help companies navigate uh, uh, basically in sourcing renewable energy and understand what kind of renewable energy sourcing options are uh, available in the market and how many of those options are actually credible to make uh, renewable energy uses claims and uh, how many of those options have been actually used by companies in United Kingdom and uh, that will demonstrate uh, the most prevalent renewable energy options uh, being chosen by companies uh, over there. So let's begin. So I'll start with a small introduction of CDP. Um, so CDP is a global environmental reporting platform. It's an international not-for-profit uh, organization headquartered in the United Kingdom. Uh, so our head office is in London. However, we operate uh, pretty much uh, global. So we have offices in almost uh, 
12 countries and then we have locations uh, 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 in other parts of the world as well like where we have representatives and who help us to uh, basically drive our environmental reporting platform and help companies cities states and region to report their environmental information uh, to various stakeholders so how we work is uh, we have various environmental reporting platform for example we have like climate change reporting platform forest platform uh, water uh, and uh, uh, supply chain as well as cities uh, states and uh, region disclosure platform so almost 525 plus investors with close to 96 trillions of dollars of asset under management are our institutional signatories there are 110 supply chain members who also provided us uh, basically endorsed our program and we helped them to collect information from their value chain about the uh, uh, various environmental parameters and uh, this is based on the last year figure there are around 7000 companies reported to cdp in 2018 and 620 plus cities also disclosed their information uh, via our disclosure platform and another 120 states uh, and regions also measured their environment, environmental impact and provided this information via CDP's disclosure platform. So why uh, I'm mentioning uh, about this is specifically important uh, to get a sense like what actually companies are doing, what kind of information they are disclosing and how this is relevant in terms of energy procurement and reporting, especially in the, in the United Kingdom. So. So coming back to the United Kingdom, uh, just a couple, uh, some down information is the renewable energy share is already is high. Uh, renewable energy capacity was like 44 gigawatt. This is at the end of 2018. And uh, this is growing year on year basis. And the low carbon electricity share of uh, generation recorded at 52% in 2018 via mix of renewable energy sources and as you can see from this particular chart over here, uh, the capacity is growing on year on year basis and the generation associated with that is, is really growing, uh, growing and uh, which is also basically demonstrating a case that renewable energy sources are, are available in the United Kingdom and companies can use those renewable energy sourcing options to procure more and more renewable energy and reduce their scope to emissions going forward. So, looking at the size uh, of the market and uh, how many companies are actually reporting on energy consumption how many of them are actually uh, actively procuring the new energy this is something uh, we get a sense from the data reported by various uh, companies to cdp so in 2018 close to 692 companies having operations in uk reported to cdp and this is not just uh, UK based companies, uh, these are like global companies having operations in UK. Of course, these also include UK headquartered companies. Uh, all of these 692 companies have reported 8 million tons of scope to greenhouse gas emissions. And the scope to emission is a result of purchased energy consumption. And that's the way this is particularly uh, connected in, uh, in terms of sourcing renewable energy. It's like companies, whoever are interested to reduce their scope to emissions, they have like uh, they, they need to primarily shift to renewables or other low carbon uh, energy sources so out of the 692 many companies have actually reported uh, renewable energy consumption or we call it like low carbon energy consumption so 66 percent of low carbon energy purchases and consumed have been reported in 2018 which is really huge uh, comparatively in other parts of the world and and ensure and demonstrate a very a good business case of uh, sourcing renewables in the United Kingdom. So particularly going down uh, into detail what exactly are happening over there. So this has been uh, the substantiated with the data reported uh, by various companies to, um, uh, to CDP via our climate change disclosure platform. So here on this particular slide, this is a slightly old information. This is the report we have uh, worked with International Renewable Energy Development Agency. And uh, this uh, information is based on various uh, data set. For example, primarily the CDP data set. And it shows that close to 106 companies uh, in United Kingdom have 
actively sourced renewable energy and the share of the if, if you consider the share of overall uk companies in the sample size of 2400 companies that shows around 41 percent of companies were actively sourcing renewable energy this is really this is really really huge uh, going further detail many of these companies actually have overarching targets like 100% renewable energy targets. So here we're talking about uh, particularly RE100 initiative. And uh, if you look at this, uh, this chart here, there are many companies from United Kingdom who have joined RE100 initiative and took 100% renewable energy targets on them. So if we go by uh, companies by their region, uh, the country of operation, this is country, uh, country headquarters, so there are Many companies in United States, but which is followed by United Kingdom. So United Kingdom is on the second position in terms of overall representation in our unit initiative. Uh, overall, Europe is on 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 the top in sourcing renewables and also com uh, committing to our unit initiative. So Europe remained the region with highest number of our unit members, like close to 47% in 2019, and the 17% of members are headquartered in the UK. So close to 30 members uh, who have joined the initiative and committed to 100% renewable power. So this is the renewable energy sourcing options. Uh, so we consider credible as per r one in the technical criteria. And uh, mostly these options are very much prevalent uh, in developed markets. So we talk about like uh, the self-generated renewable electricity, then the purchased renewable electricity. Under these two headers, uh, companies can produce their renewable energy on site and uh, use it for capital consumption. And the procurement of renewable energy happens via a variety of sourcing options, like uh, mostly on the PPAs, uh, the green tariffs, or unbundled attribute certificates. The area of our discussion today is on the power purchase segment. So I have uh, uh, pulled out information to focusing on power purchase agreement. And uh, uh, so looking at the data reported by companies. Uh, so this, these are the most prevalent option in the United Kingdom. So mostly it's on the on-site renewables, uh, the grid transfer. So when we say grid transfer, it's actually a power purchase agreement, uh, green tariffs and unbundled attribute certificates in the, in the form of guarantee of origin, cert uh, origin certificates. So these were the most uh, chosen option by corporates uh, reported uh, from UK. And uh, looking at the data, of R100 members is around uh, 10 terawatt hour of electricity demand by 65 companies who are committed to R100 initiative. And uh, around 53 companies in UK purchased and consume around 8 terawatt hour of renewable energy, which is 82% of their overall electricity uh, uh, they have consumed in 2018. So when we say 53 companies, those are companies not just headquartered in UK, but the other global companies, they have operations in UK. So this is actually the demand of uh, electricity in UK, within the territory of UK. So out of this uh, uh, demand and renewable energy consumption, around 445 gigawatt hour of consumption is happened via PPAs uh, and uh, Five companies, five large companies actually, they have reported these deals uh, and they have reported 445 gigawatt hour of consumption. So these deals basically were from like four uh, like uh, wind energy projects and two solar PV uh, projects. Uh, those have been reported in 2018. So that shows a significant uh, size of the market based on the CDP data. Like, uh, uh, like growing number of companies around 600, 700 companies have reported this information to CDP and uh, their intention towards sourcing renewable energy. And out of them, like close to 100, 150 companies, they are actively sourcing renewable energy. And when we say actively, it's basically, it's a voluntary commitment from company side to source renewable energy via EPAs or any other uh, medium. And, uh, and looking at the RE100 initiative, there are like, uh, 30 companies from UK, they have 100% renewable energy target. So overall, it shows a growing uh, uh, interest in sourcing renewable energy and uh, adopting more active options to source renewable energy, such as power purchase agreements and uh, 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 green consumer tariffs, etc. In terms of key, key drivers, uh, many companies have reported uh, like CSR concerns or management of greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, the economics of renewable energy, those are the top three 
uh, drivers towards uh, making this decision uh, from the company's perspective to uh, commit to uh, initiatives like RE100 and uh, source renewable energy actively. Of course, there are other reasons as well, like the shareholder request, policy, or air quality, um, and others like energy management. Those were also a few of the drivers supported by companies to so, um, basically to stroll them to source renewable energy going forward. So uh, the key resources in the space of cooperative renewable energy is something uh, I specifically added this information over here so that like after the webinar, if you want to have information about what's going on and uh, what are the credible way to source renewable energy, where is the criteria and uh, like uh, what kind of information is over there which can help you to make your renewable energy uses claims in your external communication. So this is something uh, you can use is RE100 technical criteria which is out there, which outlines uh, the credible options to source renewable energy. Uh, then making credible renewable energy uses claims. This is the paper, which is set of principles, which can help you to choose the best credible options to source renewable energy uh, available in particular market. And there are uh, RE100 progress report, as well as leadership paper, which is basically a progress report, like what companies are doing in the market and the leadership paper provide information about what count as leadership in terms of sourcing renewable energy. Like, you know, like nowadays, many companies are calling themselves as a leader in sourcing renewable energy, but what really counts as a real leadership? This is something we have outlined in RE100 leadership paper. So I highly recommend uh, uh, all of you to have a look of these documents are available on RE100 website. And uh, yeah, and any information you can email me and uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. And I will uh, hand over to Lee now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shai Lesh, for your uh, presentation. It's, uh, it's very interesting. And, um, you know, it's quite, um, I'd say, you know, striking to see that uh, one of the main reasons companies have decided to source renewable energy was through client requests. But we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later during the questions. So um, I'll hand over to you, uh, Lee. And, uh, you know, in Will's lease, uh, getting his presentation uh, up on the screen, I'd like to remind all of you that you can ask questions. Don't be shy, pose your questions on the Q&A box you can see at the bottom. And then, um, well, over to you, Lee. You can see your presentation. You can, you're still, uh, your microphone. He's on mute, though. There we go. Holly, we have the technology. Uh, okay, so thank you very much, Alice. That was a really helpful introduction in terms of following on to uh, what I like to talk about. And being a lawyer, I'm afraid I have to start with a caveat in that uh, my infant daughter decided that uh, she is teething at the moment and had me up between kind of midnight and 3 a.m. So. Uh, if at any point any of this presentation doesn't make any sense, please do feel free to uh, ask Q&A or to contact me. My uh, contact details will be provided at the end. So uh, apologies in advance if there's any rambling. That's just a bit of lack of sleep. Anyone with kids will know all about that. Um, so in terms of moving on from a shy last presentation, I think when we're talking about the British corporate renewable PPA market, we are talking about a legal instrument. So it's a power purchase agreement. So it is really helpful to kind of look at the legal framework in the UK and where that fits into the legal framework. So in terms of Norton Rose Fulbright, uh, we're an international law firm with a real strength in a variety of sectors, but particularly energy, me being an energy lawyer. So we have a footprint across the world and that really means that we can use and lessons learned from our different offices. Um, in terms of the practice, we're tier one in all of the major publications, so um, Chambers, Legal 500, etc. But in particular, just on corporate PPAs in the UK, we've actually advised on more than 50% of the PPAs that have been signed in the UK. So hopefully that means uh, we're in a good place to kind of discuss the, uh, the legal framework and some of the um, developments. And because of the network that we have in terms of across Europe, the Middle East, Australia and the USA, it means that we're able to um, utilize our network as legal advisors to look at the innovative structures and the developments across the globe and look at kind of lessons learned and best practice in the corporate uh, PPA markets. So if we're going to talk about electricity regulatory landscape in GB, 
it is helpful to do a quick history lesson and I won't uh, bore people too much, but if you're coming at this from an international perspective and aren't familiar with the way that we set up the uh, GB electricity market and you may be used to perhaps uh, state owned entities and the like, it's helpful just to understand that originally um, back in the 1940s, we had a nationalized um, electricity system um, uh, with the Central Electricity Generating Board. And then in the 90s, there was the privatization process. And as part of the privatization process, we moved to a pool, which may be familiar to many of you dialing in from around the world, because in fact, the, uh, the pools that are still active in many jurisdictions actually use the basis of the old British electricity pool. Um, so uh, many of the architects of that exported that and went around the world, but there were criticisms of the pool. So what we did was we implemented NITA and that introduced a bilateral market. So that bilateral contracts between suppliers and generators liberalized the market. There were some further um, kind of criticisms of NITA, so we made it better. That's an electricity law joke, if any of you uh, want to ever make one. And in a uh, better kind of made sure that both England and Wales and Scotland was one system. And it means that we've got a liberalized electricity supply market. It's actually interesting to talk about nationalization at the moment. Anyone who follows UK politics will be aware that the opposition party is talking about the renationalization of energy assets in the UK. One of the defenses to that is the fact that it's such a heavily regulated licensed system that we don't actually need renationalization. All we need is just off gem as the regulator to uh, be a bit more interventionist and perhaps kind of sort out the problems. But when we're talking about um, a liberalized electricity market in terms of generation and supply, which are relevant to port PPAs, it's important to note that if you want to do, if you want to touch electricity in the UK, you need a license unless there's an exemption. So the Electricity Act 1989 says, if you want to be any part of the chain in the UK, so generation, transmission, distribution, or supply, you'll need to be licensed, sign up to the license. And in addition to the license conditions, you need to sign up to the industry codes. An example on the left is the types of industry codes that you may have to sign up to if you are a licensed supplier. So if you want to supply electricity in the UK, as you can imagine, there's a, a lot of uh, detail in there and it's quite onerous. There's been a recognition in recent years that it is too onerous and Ofgem has introduced the kind of license like model, but generally it is still viewed as being very complicated if you want to kind of supply electricity in the UK. And that acts as a bit of a barrier in terms of implementing models for PPAs and the like. So if we just kind of think of business as usual, so this would be a kind of normal uh, how the UK, so how the GB setup is. So a developer will uh, enter into an offtake arrangement with for simplicity, a licensed supplier in the UK, so the holder of a licensed uh, electricity license, and they will enter into a power purchase agreement whereby the renewable developer sells its power to the licensed supplier. In turn, the licensed supplier in the right hand box will then supply electricity to a corporate under what we kind of generally describe as an electricity supply agreement, but it is just a form of power purchase agreement. It, when we're talking about kind of corporate PPAs, I'm sure many people who are attending here, and it is a bit of a buzzword. And when I was talking at um, a Goldman's event last year on corporate PPAs, just before I spoke, someone said to me, oh, what do you mean by a corporate PPA? I'm mean, excited to hear what you take that to mean. It really has become a bit of a badge for lots of different types of uh, procurement of green electricity. But really in this context, we're talking about the direct purchase by a corporate of a developer's power. So if we imagine it here in this uh, diagram, it is the corporate kind of bypassing the system and saying, look, I want to approach the developer and contract with the developer. In that case, we need to think about the different models that would be applicable to the UK. And the first model, this one is actually the simplest one. So the off-grid kind of private wire PPA. And the simplification of this is that, as mentioned previously, the Electricity Act says that you have to be licensed unless there are exemptions. If you're not gonna be interacting with the grid, then you may be able to rely on one of those exemptions. So if you are just consuming on power, if you're consuming your power on site, then you may be able to benefit from that exemption and it simplifies things. But when we're talking about kind of an off-grid PPA, so we may be talking about uh, wind turbines on a business park or solar panels on an office site, something like that. The, the point to note is that in an, in an academic sense, it is a very simple structure because the developer produces the power and sells it to the corporate full stop. However, it's very unlikely, particularly with the intermittent nature of renewable generation and the relevant corporate demand that the developer's production profile 
exactly matches the corporate's requirements. So unless it is just a single wind turbine and uh, perhaps you know, a couple of solar panels on a roof, it's a, if it's an actual uh, renewable plant, chances are that that developer's profile will not match the corporate's demand. So while you have a corporate PPA, the developer is likely to need a grid connection. So the line that's pointed down there, or it may need to kind of piggyback off of the existing grid connection that the corporate has. So already we're layering in some complexities there. And if it is uh, by its nature, a um, intermittent uh, generation, so wind, solar, et cetera, the corporate is likely to need to make up the shortfall. The corporate will have a licensed electricity supply agreement. Uh, so an electricity supply agreement in place of licensed supplier. So as you can see, we've already got a few complexities to add into this structure. And this is the simple one. The second kind of structure is the physical PPA. But by and large, the two most common in the UK will be physical PPAs and the off-grid structure. And the physical PPA here, in terms of the UK, we're actually, um, in the past five to 10 years, we're one of the early movers in terms of um, the corporate PPAs in the UK. And there was a suite of some of the major players about kind of five, six, seven, eight years ago, who kind of went in and did the back-to-back -back model, um, which is very applicable in the UK. And what that is, is that corporate says, okay, I'm going to buy purchase, I'm going to purchase uh, electricity direct from you developer. However, as we're aware, you are unable to kind of self supply legally in the UK. So the corporate needs to put in place a sleeving arrangement with a licensed supplier. So while the corporate PPA will say that the corporate will purchase that electricity, in practice, the electricity will be passed from the developer to a licensed supplier who in turn will pass it on to the corporate. So uh, we advise on a number of the early uh, movers in terms of the um, UK and we had the, what, what you saw was the corporates would put in place back to back arrangements utilizing what at the time it was a very kind of consolidated market in the uh, electricity supply world and the big six would just use their form of, corp of um, normal power purchase agreements as the template and then just this would form the basis of your back to back corporate PPA arrangement. So in terms of the physical PPA that's uh, it's an established uh, model to be used in the UK, but now we're starting to see the complexities of if it's an as produced PPA, there's the volume and risk profile. And we're starting to see some corporates going out to market with RFP saying, I don't just want to procure um, you know, any amount of electricity. I want firm volumes. Can you offer me that? So there needs to be contractual physical solutions to that. The third model, which is a bit more popular um, over in the US and in other jurisdictions, is the kind of virtual or kind of synthetic PPA. And this is, as you saw from the previous slide, it's quite similar to the as produced because the corporate is still directly buying power from the developer, but it is not looking to take that physical delivery of the electricity. So it is a kind of cash settled uh, contract, which is a derivative of the, um, of the underlying power. So the corporate agrees under the corporate PPA to buy the developer's power, but in practice, the developer will be selling that to a licensed supplier and have the merchant risk, which is mitigated by the hedge that is formed by the virtual PPA. In terms of the virtual PPAs, we have seen them signed in the UK. They're not as prolific as in the US, but it is one of the solutions that really are required in terms of applying the corporate PPA model to the UK. And uh, as Shalesh alluded to there, there's been a massive deployment of renewables in the UK, but that's happened at the same, and a lowering of cost of renewables as we're all aware. At the same time, there's been a real kind of decline in government subsidies. So a lot of people are looking for corporate PPAs to be your route to market, to be your bankable revenue stream. And really kind of the focus is on trying to make the uh, core PPA be the solution to the, uh, to the questions. The issue with the virtual PPA as opposed to the as produced, um, whilst it is intended to be a simplification because you don't have to deal with the physical uptake of power, it is a derivative because you are talking about um, a cash settlement of an underlying um, supply of electricity that isn't actually delivered. So with that, you will have financial services implications and certain corporates are better set up because their nature to be dealing with kind of GB law and EU, at least for the time being, uh, we'll see where we get with Brexit um, on the financial services side. In terms of the challenges and solutions, we can go through this in the uh, Q&A, but at a general level, I think it's fair to say that the complexity, the challenges that are faced by corporate PPAs in the UK are very similar to those around the world. One of the big ones is gonna be kind of corporate buyers coming into this world and perhaps not quite understanding the normal renewable development risk profile. 
And as you mentioned before, the fact that there's this lack of contract standardization. We're seeing certain contract standardization appearing throughout the world just by the nature of the big players um, and who actually has um, procured um, corporate PPAs and say has a preferred form. However, different entities are in different markets and I've sat there at the table where one party has said, we have a perfectly bankable form of PPA, let's start with this. And the counterparty has said, we also have a perfectly bankable form of PPA. So it, that can be uh, not the perfect uh, starting point for negotiations. On the volume and shape risk, as we said, we're kind of moving away from the simple as produced and looking for the developer to be taking more volume and shape risk. You can bring in kind of the license supplier relationship and balancing parties. And in terms of the way you can mitigate volume and shape risk, you have the contractual solution, so you put it into the agreement itself, or physical solutions such as co-location of storage by the meter and other kind of um, actual asset solutions. And in terms of the contractual risk and allocation, as we've said, because we've had the drying up of subsidies in the UK, there is a real focus at the moment in GB in the UK to look at corporate PPAs to fill this gap as being the revenue stream and route to market for a plethora of different um, developers. But you always have that competing um, friction between developers who want to have a bankable instrument they can take to their bank and lower the cost of capital and the corporate themselves who are quite different. Uh, we can come on to it when we do the Q&A, but if you actually look at the corporates who are very active in the US versus the corporates active in MENA um, and in particular Europe, it is actually um, very different types of businesses and they come at this with very different requirements. Finally, in terms of the further reading, I cannot recommend enough if you want to get into the detail of it, the World Business Council of Sustainable Development publications on PPAs. If you want to really understand how they've developed kind of the key terms across, and this is a global perspective, uh, we'll point out the fact that uh, Norton Rose Fulbright uh, did assist with the drafting of this, uh, but that means that we feel pretty confident in the product that's out there. Um, and that is what I look like when I've actually had some sleep and my uh, daughter hasn't kept me up all night. So do feel free to get in contact afterwards if the Q&A doesn't uh, meet your requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lee, for your presentation. Very interesting. So uh, we've had a few questions, uh, a few, um, one of them on the uh, Q&A box and a couple of others on the chat box. I'd uh, encourage the audience to please send in more questions. This is your chance to get them answered live. So um, the first question is from Chico, and he asks, uh, which of the three types of corporate PPA is most used in the UK? Um, and then he asks, is the same trend observed in the rest of Europe and North America? So, um, Lee, would you like to? Yes, yes shall, I, shall I start with that one? Um, in terms of the three types of corporate, so the good news in terms of that presentation is that all types have been used in the UK. So it's not like we've got a market where we don't have one of the types. Um, the, for the smaller um, generators, the on-site is the easier. So uh, there's a number of kind of on-site um, generators because it's a slightly different offering. It's perhaps not what we consider a traditional corporate PPA to be. It is really a private wire arrangement. Um, the physical PPAs, as I say, historically have been the majority um, of the UK-based um, PPAs, but we have um, seen virtual PPAs start to come into the market. We ourselves have been involved in closing one uh, just kind of last year, and we're seeing more. Um, and now we're looking to uh, the US and Europe for kind of lessons learned and uh, seeing the direction it's going as regards um, virtual PPAs. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Shai Lesh, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, just to add into what Lee said, uh, we are getting like well, growing uh, communication from various committed companies to our unit initiative, as well as other reporting companies to CDP about virtual PPA. So there is a growing interest and uh, companies are willing to participate in this kind of scheme and uh, basically get power from virtual PPAs. Uh, I've sensed... Uh, there are a couple of reasons to this. Uh, for example, it adds a level of flexibility into this. And of course, uh, there are the choices from companies' perspective as well, whether they prefer the physical power or just the uh, uh, attributes associated with renewable energy. So it's actually the individual decisions uh, varies companies to company. Okay. 
Thank you. So um, moving on to the next question. So um, it's, it's a question by uh, Sienna on the um, on the chat box. She's asking whether um, can you give us an indication of the corporate PPA prices already signed in Great Britain, and what about green tariffs? What are the other costs in relation to brown electricity purchases? Any indication of that? Is that information you have now? I, as as a lawyer, we wouldn't tend to, uh, we wouldn't yeah. tend to uh, go into the financials, or uh, and we're always very nervous about confidentiality. I do know that Shalesh may be able to talk to you better. There are publications where there'll be kind of average prices and the data is collected and put out there. So maybe Shalesh can talk to it better in terms of the uh, the prices sign. I guess I, what I would say is that there have been different prices based on different tenors. So, you know, there is going to be a different price with a 15 year PPA as opposed to the kind of five, seven years that we're starting to see RFPs coming out um, just in the last kind of six, 12 months and the drying up subsidies. Um, the other point is that um, I think generally, historically, we've been looking at the 10, 15 year. We've yet to see the kind of big 20 year court PPAs that we've seen in the Nordics. The team here has advised on a number of the Nordic deals and currently doing it at the moment, but it's just a slightly different market from the UK up there in kind of Norway and uh, Finland and um, with Norpool and the like, and just the, the actual corporate buyers that are up there. And I mean, on the corporate buyer point, as I said before, if you think traditionally people at the moment in corporate PPA world, if they're US focused, may think about the big, the big four tech, um, you know, the kind of the fangs that are getting involved. But if you look at Bloomberg Energy Finance or any of the um, publications, Shilas has said that if you look at MENA in Europe, then actually, while some of the tech companies do appear in the top 10, the top 10 has actually got some very different kind of um, corporate entities in there. You've got retailers, you've got um, manufacturers, you've got transport companies. So it is actually quite different corporates that are coming to the table. Um, and they bring with that kind of different points on the legal and the pricing side. So, uh, Shailesh, you look like you want to say something. Is that the case or should we move on to the next question? Oh, it's absolutely fine. Let's move to the new question. Okay, great. So, uh, so Martin is actually is asking about the duration of PPA, corporate PPAs in the UK. I think uh, you already gave some indication of that, Lee. You're saying like seven years or so to 10 years. Yeah, so when we had the kind of the original swathe of back to back PPAs, so we had the likes of Sainsbury's, uh, Marks and Spencer's, BT, etc., about five, seven years ago, there was a big tranche of PPAs that were signed, and those were your normal kind of 10 to 15 year PPAs. And what they did was the reason for that, um, in terms of the tenure, the reason for that is it just mirrored the renewables obligation because those are renewables obligation products. We've now, as people may be aware, come through some pretty whole scale electricity market reform in the UK over the past few years. And we've moved away from a certificate scheme to uh, move to a contract for difference. Although the contract for difference auctions um, at the moment at least are really just, the, the forthcoming one is really only for offshore wind and certain other technologies. So there's, there's not really subsidies for onshore wind and solar at the moment. So. In the natural um, tenure would have matched your kind of renewable supports tenure. And now we're going to the market and the market's having to relook at what the correct tenure um, for PPA should be. And so that's kind of where we're moving to. And as you say, we've, there has been a couple of industry events which have been trying to talk into government and question and off German talking how much intervention and do we need a market form to be produced um, to help uh, investment and the like. And there's lots of different voices from industry, some saying leave market forces to do what, what it needs to do, others calling for more intervention. But I think we've certainly seen a shortening. The other point is it's really important to think about where the banks and financial institutions come in. A lot of the lenders are actually would prefer perhaps a shorter um, repayment term and look at refinancing um, before they get comfortable on the term matching the support that's granted under the renewables obligation, because that was your guaranteed support. Um, period. In the post um, support world, it's going to be a different offering. Hmm. Right. Thank you very much. Um, and, um, you know, another question that came on the back of, of this, uh, the, your um, answers, uh, Lee, I think is uh, 
what happens at the end of a seven year PPA with the asset? It still has a majority of its design life uh, left. Is uh, the mismatch just due to the risk attached with locking both in both parties? So um, I suppose that they're asking, you know, why a seven year PPA? Why not a 20 year PPA, which is a lifetime of a renewable asset? I think the, the answer to that would be that uh, try and find a corporate who is willing to sign a, uh, a 20 year. And that, that's the other point in terms of where if we've moved from um, kind of subsidy backed kind of 10, 15 year to match kind of a government subsidy period into a pure play market, really it is saying, OK, what are corporates willing to offer? And generally corporates, because um, at the end of the day, I like I like to say PPAs, including corporate PPA corporate PPAs are very simple agreements. They are just an agreement for the supply of green electricity. I appreciate I've just spent the past 10 minutes talking about the complexities, uh, but you know the, the team here tries to view them and explain them as simple instruments. Mm -hmm. And really corporates, um, a lot of the kind of corporate um, buyers, the commercial leads, will it, this will just be one of many different um, uh, things they'll be procuring for the business. And they will have internal requirements and sign-offs um, depending on the tenor and length of the contracts they enter into. And often you can get a five-year contract um, away without kind of board approval. When you start getting to five, seven years, seven years plus, that starts becoming a very different um, question to the corporate. And suddenly the corporate, you know, it needs to be escalated. And uh, really it's a bigger question for a corporate to sign up for a seven to 10 year um, hedge and that taking a view on electricity prices for that time. Right. And um, yeah, it's a matter of them, I suppose, corporates not wanting to lock into a, an agreement for so long. You know, I think it's probably what it boils down to. So um, there's a question um, about electricity prices. So do corporate PPAs offer good value compared to more traditional PPAs, given the recent increase in electricity market prices? I don't know if uh, either of you has uh, um, any idea on this, uh, yeah, on this question. Conscious I've been talking a lot. Shalash, do you want to have a go and then I can follow up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, not much, but uh, we have seen a couple of companies uh, reporting on economic incentives uh, before entering into PPA. So, I think, yeah, so there is a difference between what utilities is providing and what they can get via PPA, the bilateral PPAs we're talking about. So, but very few, uh, most of them actually pay premium price uh, to get renewable energy. So that's my uh, broader, broader understanding. But if you want to add anything into this thing. Yes, certainly. I mean, uh, in the UK, like many others, we've got the kind of established offtake players. Um, I've actually spent some time in industry on common as a uh, senior legal counsel in one of the, uh, the major players. And I think the, the point to say is that it, it's a market out there and um, those traditional offtakers are competing against the corporates. Um, and depending on the corporate, um, the individual corporate's business case, it may be more sensible for it to just go with a kind of a shorter term, just kind of offtake a PPA. Historically, there was an ability to kind of get some price fixes and the like. It depends where you're at. I guess the other point to say is that there's a lot of players um, in the UK offering a lot of different products um, in terms of green tariffs, green solutions. So, um, but I think generally, and Charles should probably agree, it's a buyer's market out there. Um, yeah. I think that it is a buyer's market. The, 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 best develop, the best developments and the best developers will get their projects through. Um, somehow, depending on we don't know, but uh, it's certainly the strength is with buyers in the UK at the moment. Yeah, and just, just to add into this, uh, it's not just the price uh, corporates are looking at. Of course, the cost competitiveness is one of the reasons, uh, along with getting renewable energy attributes from the corporate renewable energy PPAs, but the long term visibility on the cost is another point which corporates consider before entering into this deal. So basically why entering into PPA let's say seven years or more than uh, seven years, they're actually locking uh, the price or with some fluctuation. So that provides them long-term visibility on the prices, which uh, in return is a kind of energy security for the company. So I think we should also consider that point uh, in the discussion. And I guess just one uh, further point to say would just be in terms of the identity of kind of developers entering into this. Um, 
as I've mentioned before, for CFDs, although there's not support for onshore and solar, there is support for offshore wind. And if you win a CFD, then you have that government support for that um, you know, healthy period of time. However, we're still seeing the offshore wind projects entering into corporate PPAs. So an offshore wind project already has a corporate PPA of sorts because it has a contract for difference uh, with a government owned uh, counterparty. So it already has that hedge, but obviously it needs to um, actually um, give its power because the CFD document itself uses a market reference price by reference to the um, UK market. So even where we have kind of large scale developments um, that already have that hedge, there are corporates who are willing to um, kind of purchase that um, under co corporate power purchase arrangements. And as Charles correctly says, that's just about the story that is told um, in terms of the annual uh, reports and reporting requirements. And the story can be told in many ways. Um, there's often accusations for, um, flying around of greenwashing, of corporates not truly doing additionality, so not actually bringing projects online. Um, and from a corporate having spent many, many uh, months uh, negotiating a certain corporate PPA, there is a bit of a chicken and egg thing when we're talking about kind of corporate PPA and the construction documents. Because when you've got a corporate PPA that acts as your kind of key revenue stream where you don't have the um, subsidy mechanic, really um, that if that's your revenue stream you need to incorporate things from if you're a wind farm you know your turbine supply arrangement your panel arrangement and the question is which do you sign first if you've end up signing all your project agreements your epc your tsa etc then and then sign your corporate ppa because it needs all that information has that actually have you know has that the signing of that corporate ppa uh, enabled that project you know is is it providing the additionality and is that the reason the projects come on you could argue that uh, if you've already signed EPC, TSAs and the like, then that project's already uh, on there. So there is a lot of um, additionality and greenwashing concerns, but corporates have different ways of addressing those. So um, we have still a number of questions uh, left. One of them is, um, uh, why should an off-taker enter a PPA agreement when they have the option in the UK to purchase Rigos for every megawatt hour they consume? So Rigos are an interesting one uh, because uh, obviously in terms of GUs, kind of guarantees of origin, these are just the, um, the UK version. GUs are very important to a lot of the European, uh, European projects. Historically, in the UK, the, the, the PPAs that were signed, you know, five, 10 years ago, they were focused on ROCs, so the Renewable Energy Certificates as, produced, um, as uh, provided by Ofgem in the UK. And normally, green, uh, green PPAs would just say, okay, I'll have a peppercorn, I'll give you one pound for your regas. They really didn't have a value in the UK just because of that market. We've seen in the last two and a half, three years, regos attract a value um, in the UK. And suddenly um, we're seeing a market for those and seeing prices. I remember the first day that uh, one of my colleagues came across and said, I've got a PPA here and they've given Rigo's value. Have you seen that? At the time I hadn't, now we are seeing it, but it is still a developing market. And there is then you're thinking about um, the, the Brexit and the like, at the moment we've got assurances on that, but there are other points with uh, Rigo's and the market for those as um, tradable instruments. So I think that Corporates are looking to tell the story um, and perhaps Rigos aren't necessarily the right story for each corporate to tell. Uh, Shailesh, do you feel free to add, in, add anything? Yeah, in fact, uh, many, many corporates are preferring uh, going ahead with unbundled uh, energy attribute certificates like Rigo uh, because those, uh, those provides kind of flexibility to corporates. But again, uh, this is, uh, this is a personal choice. Uh, many corporates prefer doing uh, PPAs because they think like entering into a PPA is actually supporting a new capacity coming to the grid. So that's that's the concept. So it's a kind of additionality, but it's not clearly uh, additionality uh, we can call it. But uh, when we enter into a PPA with a new capacity which is being added, so it a kind of uh, increase the level of confidence between the generator and the consumer who are interested and demonstrate to showcase that because of their action, 
the new capacity is being coming to coming online. So that's that's the uh, reason many corporates are choosing PPA. In terms of unbundled attribute certificates like Rego, the capacity is already there. Maybe even in the case of Rego, there can be a new capacity added to the grid, but it's again it's, it's it's very subjective and it's a decision from companies what options they need to choose. In terms of uh, credible renewable energy sourcing options, all of the options are credible. Companies might choose PPA. Companies can choose uh, ESEs well, like Rego's. But I, I uh, recommend uh, reading R100 leadership paper, and we actually discussed this uh, various uh, impactful procurement methods uh, over there. So this is something if anyone are interested. And just one final point to add on that: it's uh, it's not so much UK, but uh, certainly parts of Europe and the Nordics. In terms of the corporate PPAs that have been signed, we've kind of seen two instruments whereby one is for the green power and one is for the goose kind of the certs um, and that kind of shows as um Chesh kind of describes the fact that you might not you, you sometimes corporates just want the green electricity and don't want to kind of go through the uh the rigmarole of um dealing with certificates and setting all of the uh the systems up so we have seen kind of these uh, multi-contract um, PPAs whereby you've got one for just the green electricity and one for the relevant renewable energy certificates. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a, a question which is more general. I don't know if you can shed any light on it. It says uh, whether you see increased interest in proxy revenue swaps in Europe or the UK as well. Any views on that? Charles, did you want to? Uh, sorry, I couldn't find that question in the Q&A box. Can you please repeat it? Yeah, I'll um, bring it back. So, uh, yeah, that one is, uh, do you, it is by William and it says, do you see increased interest in the proxy revenue swaps in Europe slash UK as well? Okay, yeah. So there is a growing interest in Europe uh, for sure. And uh, I can see almost uh, five, six companies uh, in the last quarter based on my conversation with them. So they have shown interest uh, in this, not particularly from UK, but uh, yeah, many of those companies have operations in UK. So maybe they will expand that uh, in UK going forward. But not, no, I haven't seen any concrete uh, deal right now. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shailesh. Um, and um, the, um, we have probably time for one more question. And um, right, so it's a question from Stavros Stasos, and he asks Isn't selling slash buying the green electricity separately from the green certificates, double counting? Uh, let me understand this question well. It's not really clear to me. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Um, it probably means from the carbon perspective, probably. Uh, uh, actually, it looks like uh, the double counting of attributes, and uh, we are talking about renewable energy attributes, so I guess uh, if a company follows set, uh, set protocols like the scope two reporting guidance, which is available, uh, which companies can use. So I think in terms of energy attribute certificate, which is already certified, for example, Rego uh, in UK, which is already there. And once the Rego certificate generated and canceled, so in the entire value chain, so there is an assurity that there is notable counting. But, uh, in terms of carbon offset and renewable energy attribute uses on the same time, then I guess it, it uh, will be definitely lead to double counting. So either it should be used at renewable energy attributes or as green uh, offset if there is a certification mechanism for this, but not both on the same time. Uh, in terms of renewable energy reporting, of course, all the renewable energy certificates as well as PPAs bundled with renewable energy certificates like Rego. Uh, companies can use a zero emission factor for the portion of renewable energy is actually being consumed uh, as per the PPA agreement or as per the number of certificates they have got. Thank you very much, uh, Shailesh. And uh, I think like uh, 
right now we have just about three minutes, so it's time to, um, you know, wind this webinar down. And uh, thank you very much to all of the uh, uh, all of the attendees um, who have been here with us and to speakers as well. Um, so tomorrow we'll be back um, here talking about um, renewable PPAs, but in the United States. So um, you can see the details on the chat box if you can, um, if you're interested in that webinar as well. And um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Shai Lesh, and thank you very much, uh, Lee. I don't know if you'd like to say any uh, parting words to our audience. Uh, no, but yeah, th thanks for uh, the all the time for from all attendees today. And if you have any follow-up questions, uh, you can send these questions to myself or me or Carlos. And uh, those email IDs were available at the last slide. I'm not sure uh, if you can project that slide again, Carlos. But yeah, so please uh, send your questions if you have any. Thank you Thank so much. So yeah, all of our listeners will get the presentation sent to them, so they will be able to write to you. Great. Yeah. Uh, and for me, it's just probably to echo uh, what I'd said previously. I know it's uh, given uh, all of the different complexities we've discussed right now and the fact that as much less considered experts in the field, it's just to point out the fact that they are simple instruments um, at, at a very uh, basic level. Um, and the com a lot of the complexities come from misunderstanding and kind of people um, looking at perhaps looking at, uh, at approaching them the wrong way. So we found that often kind of clients of ours have come to it, uh, come to the table thinking these are horrendously complicated um, and that, that whilst you shouldn't underestimate um, the negotiation of them, they are just um, relatively simple contracts and with the correct technical, financial, legal advisors, you can uh, do solutions in an efficient manner. Great. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Have a great day, everyone, and see you here next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.